Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here for a second time with Dr. Vivica Otessen. She's a Norwegian criminologist, and today we're going to talk about the evolution of violence, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so, Dr. Otessen, welcome back to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back. Thank you so much. So uh, last time we focused mostly on criminal behavior for obvious reasons, because you have a background on criminology. But uh, more generally, what is violence from an evolutionary perspective? Well, I don't know that violence is understood, you know, defined differently. Um, uh, depending on whether you have an evolutionary perspective or not. Okay. But what what has struck me as someone who started reading uh, the scholarly literature on violence in the late 90s and ever since, um, is that perhaps one might have come to the point we're at now a bit sooner if violence research, and then I'm thinking of domestic violence, because that's that's my field, domestic violence, domestic homicide. That we might have a pro uh, come to the point where we're at now with regards to how we're defining it and uh, with regards to the aspects of it that we're studying. If one had been more willing to look at evolutionary perspectives uh, from, uh, from the start of this research, um, domestic violence, when be one began researching it in, um, sooner than what I'm going to claim now, but if you think of, you know, now it's now it's a respectable and massive field of research. It was in like the 60s and 70s. And it was a scholarly field which was, um, and still is, not to the same extent, but still is um, colored by activist um, approaches. And the practical result of that was that one was focusing mostly on the domestic violence that men were performing. And so there's been a lag in the research that uh, was available that was being performed on the violence that women perform. And also with activist ideologically colored approaches to understanding what is violence, who's performing it and why, uh, one was explaining it with like reference to men are performing this violence because men are inherently violent. Um, and this has two problems. You're not researching women's violence and, um, <clears throat> and, and you're not necessarily uh, uh, gaining uh, a valid understanding of human nature. Uh, I, I write a fair bit about this when I write my um, texts on filicide, child homicide, how men have been understood as child homicide perpetrators because men are inherently violent. And when you're then going to um, explain women's child homicide, one has often both a scholarly literature and also in, in, in the courts and in, in the psychiatric health care have um, been grasping for straws because the understanding is women aren't inherently violent, so it has to be pathological. But this is actually not true. Women can um, perform intimate partner homicide, child homicide, um, intimate partner violence, and there's there's nothing wrong with them. There's no pathology you can refer to. So that was a problem with that you weren't studying women's violence, women's performance of violence. And also there was a limit on, on what you would describe as violence that I think could have been improved with an evolutionary appro approach. See, with an evolutionary approach, your understanding of what's at the core of domestic violence, uh, when it's intimate partner violence or uh, violence towards children, is at the core of it is a reproductive conflict. And if one had had that understanding, then the list of types of violence that we understand exist in domestic relationships might have been broadened uh, sooner than what they have. It's taken a lot of work 
also from activists. It's not just a bad thing to have activists within a scholarly field and within research, absolutely not. They have done a lot of work and finally come to the point where uh, it, it's becoming a general acceptance of that violence isn't just physical. Violence can also be sexual, violence can also be psychological and emotional, it can be financial. And the last category to have uh, appeared and become accepted and is no longer controversial to say is a category of violence is reproductive violence, which is just like all of the other categories, something that both men and women can perform reproductive violence. Reproductive violence can be either forcing a partner to enter uh, parenthood or denying your partner to enter parenthood. And this is something that both men and women can perform, um, obviously from an evolutionary perspective. However, still today, the definition of reproductive violence is that it's performed by a man towards a woman. So we're kind of, uh, we're reliving the problem of um, researching domestic physical violence of the 60s and 70s, defining it as something men perform towards women because that's how men are, um, rather than looking at it from an evolutionary perspective and understanding that both men and women um, have an evolutionary need to ensure that the partner is uh, faithful and invested. And so in an evolutionary perspective, you would have defined violence with these categories much sooner, including female aggression, female violence, and also this last category, reproductive violence, because there most certainly are women there who are forcing men into unwanted parenthood. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, of course, these are very sensitive topics and you alluded there to gender stereotypes, for example. And I think that, generally speaking, whenever someone commits an atrocious crime that involves uh, physical violence, uh, for both men and women, for some reason, people try to look for something that is supposedly wrong with them. I mean, of course, there's this is what dichotomy and we don't necessarily have to consider something just because it's natural or biological to be good we don't no. have to accept no. violence <laughs> but i i mean there's this very easy tendency for people to try to find something wrong with the person who could be who committed a violent act uh, some i don't know mental illness something wrong with their brain with their upbringing something like that but uh, at least sometimes that's not really the case i mean it's not that they are uh, behaviorally dysfunctional at least from an evolutionary perspective right it's not necessarily to be that to become uh, violent no absolutely not it can be uh, it can be uh, uh, circumstantial um like for instance when it comes to intimate partner uh, homicide uh, what martin daly and uh, margot wilson uncovered which was unknown to the field mm -hmm. of homicide research, seeing as they weren't using an evolutionary approach, they weren't asking the same questions as uh, Daly and Wilson did. And they found out that it was an age discrepancy in the couple. One used to think uh, the reason why young women were at a greater risk of being killed by an intimate partner uh, was because young women are with young men and young men, uh, if, you, if you don't categorize homicides, if you just look at homicides then your your most classic offender is a young man but that young man is then classically killing another young man when it comes to intimate partner homicide what they found out that these young women that were being victimized were being victimized of partners where you had an age discrepancy uh -huh. so if you're a man in your 40s and you experience a unwanted breakup your female partner is leaving you and she is two years younger than you. That might be a very different experience from if you're a man in your 40s and your girlfriend in her 20s leaves you mm. or your girlfriend in your 30s leaves you. And David Buss has written uh, 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 quite a bit about this on how uh, it's the man's experience of um, 
how easily can he replace this partner mm -hmm. uh, with the same reproductive value? Um, it has to do sometimes with mate value discrepancies, right? Exactly. Um, it, it, it sounds awful, but it, it, this is from an evolutionary standpoint, not from a moral standpoint, but from an evolutionary standpoint. The reproductive value of a woman in her 20s is much larger than the one in her 40s. Um, and so men will therefore, um, their reaction will be different. Uh, it will be a, a greater crisis. And... Um, and so then it becomes circumstantial, and, and so therefore it wasn't necessarily a psychopathology. Um, but once that is said, uh, most homicides, uh, uh, domestic homicides in Norway, for instance, most domestic homicides in Norway are associated with the perpetrator being psychotic or suicidal. Mm. So it's not insignificant, and it's it's... Although the evolutionary argument is that violence and homicide can be performed uh, due to circumstances, the argument is not that you will never have an increased uh, risk due to psychopathology. You, mm -hmm. you, absolutely, you absolutely will. Um, the thing is that being, a, being human and navigating life is, is really hard. Mm -hmm. And if uh, you have had an upbringing that was harsh, or your life circ current life circumstances are harsh, or if you have um, a mental state that makes you prone to psychotic episodes or suicidal ideation, life is harder. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it's, it's, you have to think of a complete picture, and in that complete picture, you have to appreciate that both men and women are capable of violence because and the notion of a uh, human species completely of in incapable of violence aside from during psychosis, um, it's just theoretically not likely. Mm -hmm. Of course, I don't want to go too much on a tangent here, but if I, if my reading of the Don't literature... I will go on a tangent. Okay, <laughs> but if my reading of the literature uh, about the relationship between psychopathology and criminal behavior is right, and if not, please correct me, uh, it seems that the vast majority of people who suffer from some sort of psychopathology do not commit crime but they are still overrepresented in the criminal population. I mean, for example, not if... Not necessarily criminal popul population, because then you're also thinking of people who, who steal bikes, right? Uh, right. Or, or, or rob banks. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're thinking of, for instance, violence and homicide, then, then yeah, it is exactly how you said it. And, and this, this can be a hard discussion to have with people. Um, Sometimes can... I also think that people misunderstand what researchers are saying, because when people say that there's an overrepresentation, what that means is that, for example, if for a particular psychopathology uh, in the general population, it, it's like one percent of people. That one percent would be like twenty-five percent of people in the criminal population. So that's what overrepresentation means. Right? Exactly. Um, but even though you are prone to having psychotic episodes, like if you some if you have some kind of form of uh, um, severe depression or uh, schizophrenia, um, you're not doomed to kill someone. And what we actually find in in the violence research is that, and so not homicide but violence, mm -hmm. is that if you if you do suffer some sort of uh, psychopathology, you're much more likely to be a victim of violence than an offender of violence. Mm -hmm. right. And I think, but I think what happens is, the, like, you, like you said in the introduction here, you know, this is, it, this is controversial, touchy, emotional topics. Um, and uh, people are worried about the stigma associated with having some kind of uh, um, uh, personality disorder or psychiatric diagnosis, because those are two different things. Yeah. Um, people are so worried that 
of the stigma that's already associated here and that the last thing they need this vulnerable group in society that we should be taking care of and helping that the last thing they need is any further stigma where people are scared that they're going to be violent and homicidal and i agree yes that is the last thing they need and absolutely is the last thing they need but we also have to be aware of the risk here so when it comes to child homicide um when we when we who research this, we see the overrepresentation, uh, the extent of that those who are committing child homicide today, because we're no longer in the like the 18th century, things the society has changed. And there are, I think we spoke about it last and we might we may very well return to it uh, uh, today. Um, but there are there are like societal structures that has made child homicide plummet. Uh, we don't have the same numbers anymore. And so those you are left with in your data are the psychotic parents and the suicidal parents. And so what we who write about this, we encourage people to, for instance, when it comes to suicidal parents, in the psychiatric health care, it's commonplace to ask people, uh, and people who have a history of being suicidal or showing tendencies to suicidal ideation, to ask them directly, do you have suicidal thoughts? Do you have suicidal plans? And uh, we who research child homicide, want, we want there to be an extra question there, that you don't just leave it at that. That if this is a parent, you ask them what their plans are for their children. Because what you see is with these uh, suicidal parents is that they are committing what is, uh, it's termed altruistic child homicides, which might sound far-fetched because altruism is helping someone to extent that it, it actually is costing you but that is the frame of mind of these parents these parents are saying that in their desperate situation um, the child is what they love the most in this world and they're thinking of it as the best parental act they can do is to include their child in an extended suicide um, and so we who research child homicide when we are seeing the proportion, not numbers, but proportion of parents who are suicidal, who are, have suicidal ideation. This is the group who's uh, performing child homicide. We want people to not just, you know, professionals or people in, 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 um, in close relations to the given parent, not just ask about the plans for themselves, but what are the plans for their, for their very dear children? Right. Uh, and I guess that perhaps another aspect that makes these questions very controversial is that I think at least sometimes people associate uh, a particular stance on the relationship between psychopathology and criminal behavior with some sort of uh, a solution to that. Like, for example, they think that Oh, so what you're say, what are you saying? We should imprison these people instead of rehabilitating them? Yeah, that's not the case at all. I mean, different criminal justice systems across the world deal with different people in different ways, of course. But uh, yeah, if someone commits crime because they suffer from mental illness, there's the possibility of rehabilitating them, and I guess that's on the table. No, no one's necessarily saying that they should just be imprisoned and left there, right? Right. Um, so in these discussions, there's a lot of jumping to conclusions mm -hmm. and there's a lot of misinterpretations, right. uh, which are rather unqualified. I mean, I've been reading this literature uh, in uh, what is then termed biosocial criminology, looking at the biological uh, markers that can make someone more vulnerable mm -hmm. to to struggling with navigating life, as I was talking about, the whole navigating of life, um, that there are certain forms of prefrontal lobes. There are certain genetic uh, um, variations that can make an individual vulnerable. But I have never read a single article ever within this field of biosocial criminology that was uh, deterministic. Mm -hmm. I wasn't very much aware of that. It is still 
you can still have a biology that makes you vulnerable, uh, but it's still um, very dependent on, on life circumstances, conditions, and what sort of help you have gotten in your life so that that vulnerability didn't manifest as criminal behavior or antisocial behavior, but that you had an opportunity, you had an environment where you could manifest other types of behavior. And, uh, and this is the same with um, uh, trying to um, identify those individuals who are suffering from personality disorders or suffering from other types of psychiatric di disorders um, to help them prior to something awful happening. Uh, and uh, and unfortunately, we're often too late as a society. Um, too often we are too late. And then it's all about helping. So I've never read a single article within the field of biosocial criminology or personality psychology or a psychiatric article that ever was talking about determinism or that ever was talking about uh, eugenics. <laughs> Or was ever talking about, like you were describing it, just putting someone in prison and leaving them there, more or less to rot. Never, ne never. And I've met quite a few of these biosocial criminologists and evolutionary psychologists within, you know, criminal, antisocial behavior, and violence, uh, domestic homicide. They have all been lovely people who want to make the world a better place through humanity. Um, so when I first started reading this uh, type of literature, I was studying psychology in uh, Bergen and later I moved to uh, Oslo to study uh, criminology and I had quite a few lecturers that were appalled by the fact that I was interested in psychology and biology and they were, they were genuinely, they were misguided, but it was still genuine. Uh, their fear of that I was going to jump to the conclusion of eugenics and I actually held a lecture uh, a few years back 10 years and 10 years is a long time but not long enough for this sort of misguided ideas of, of uh, what I was trying to say but I as a, as a terrible terrible joke in this lecture just terrible joke in this lecture uh, but to make a point, I was like, we're not trying to identify vulnerable children with regards to biological markers like a genetic vulnerability. Um, so as to like uh, rid the world of them. <laughs> <laughs> I just said it because I was like, oh, I was making a point. It was a terrible joke. It was highly unprofessional. Oh my me. God, don't, don't tell me someone took that out of context or... There was a criminologist who was greatly relieved. She was greatly relieved. She was like, I'm so glad you said that because I was worried. And I was like, I just made a terribly unprofessional joke. And she was like, but I'm so, so glad you never have said it. And she advised me, this Norwegian criminologist, she advised me that the next time you're holding a lecture on biosocial criminology, you should start your lecture by saying that the aim isn't to, and I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. No, um, it's that there, there are no texts from a biosocial perspective, a psychological perspective, a psychiatric perspective on this, where the idea is, um, of course, it was prior to Second World War, there was that sort of literature. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, even, even in the 50s and 60s, um, people were being sterilized um, against their will, certain groups, minority groups, even in Norway, post Second World War. So that was happening. I'm not going to pretend as if that didn't happen. What I'm talking about here are the researchers. Yes. Uh, the researchers that I have read since the late 90s within this field. Um, I was holding um, I was holding a lecture for the, the criminology students in Oslo for years were inviting me in to lecture on biosocial criminology for them because they, um, for many years, they weren't getting this sort of education. And for some years they were getting this education, but it was, it was aged and the, the lecturer was biased. And so they were inviting someone who was qualified in to talk to them. And one of the articles that I did start off quite, <laughs> quite soon my, in, in the lecture, uh, quite early on in the lecture, I started off with an article using uh, Danish data, a twin study, 
uh, uh, where even the title was showing that there wasn't a matter of determinism, but that you can have genetic influence. And yeah, no, people, people get muddled up. The, 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 there's a huge difference between determinism and, and vulnerability. Yeah. No, but twin studies, come on, that's eugenics, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm worried about it. Uh, quite worried about it, and um, I'm, I'm very concerned with that. And I'm probably using too much time for it for your international viewers, but it's it's quite alarming and disturbing how uh, still currently. I mean, that was like ten years ago. I'm talking about now with the Norwegian criminologists, um, but even currently, I have this term, this autumn term. In Norway, 2022, in Bergen, I was lecturing on uh, biological and evolutionary perspectives on personality for students on the clinical training program. And uh, I hadn't done that thus far. I've been, it was my fifth term in Bergen and I've been lecturing in social psychology. Uh, but this term, um, I was really happy and really excited about being allowed to hold lectures for the clinical training program students on biological and evolutionary perspectives on personality. Uh, but then I saw the curriculum, which was not chosen by me, that was chosen. Universities have to plan a given term, like half a year before that term starts. So someone, someone else, I'm assuming, not qualified within these perspectives, because I didn't find a single reference past 2010 and 12 years is a lot of time for, yes, you're raising your eyebrows, 12 years, uh, that's a long time within the field of biological and evolutionary perspectives on personality. So yeah, those- Within any field, I guess. I hope, maybe not, <laughs> I'm gonna make a terrible joke, maybe not within psychodynamic perspectives, maybe within psychodynamic perspectives, one's very happy with like Freud and Jung and Adler, but <laughs> within this perspective, oh you have to, uh, yeah, because they, they're actually teaching students those perspectives on, those perspectives are quite big in Norway among clinical uh, psychologists, actually. Um, I was a science editor in their journal for a year and a half, and there were a lot of manuscripts being sent in on, on, on psychodynamic views. Very disturbing. Um, so, and maybe there it's okay. That one uh, uh, isn't, isn't updating. Uh, but within this field, uh, terrible. And the criticism that I was supposed to then uh, um, lecture on the criticism of, uh, of uh, evolutionary and biological perspectives, that was published in 1989. The criticism mm -hmm. against using twin studies on personality uh, traits and their heritability was published in 1989. So I had to like tell the students I'm so sorry, you should be having more updated literature on this. Um, so yeah, shocking. In Norway today, one hasn't come further with regards to taking biological perspectives more serious than this. Well, don't feel too bad about that because at least until very, very recently, and probably it's still the case in Portugal, I know of certain anthropology degrees in certain universities, I'm not going to name, where they teach Freud in, in anthropology. So, yes. yeah, yeah, of course, Freud is going to teach you a lot about human culture, but anyway. <laughs> well, Freudian ideas are a part of human culture you know, popular culture. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. But let's not go there. Uh, yeah, let's avoid Freud because <laughs> whenever Freud comes to the table, it's a mess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, one question I haven't asked you yet. So what functions, because of course, from an evolutionary perspective, violence is functional. Uh, what functions does it serve? What we will then do as evolutionary psychologists, we will ask you to um, specify what category are we looking at? Because um, when a man is violent towards his partner, 
that might be very different. There might be a very different uh, uh, psychological mechanism that, uh, making him do that, motivating for that sort of behavior than if he's violent towards his child. Now, again, there will be a reproductive conflict at the core, uh, but from a reproductive conflict, um, the nature of that conflict and how it is solved can can be quite different. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, the current perspective on violence in uh, intimate relationships is that it's to, to control the other person as a resource towards your reproductive success. So a woman may want to control the man's time and financial assets to her benefit. Uh, she may uh, she may subject him to psychological violence, for instance, to decrease his uh, self esteem and make sure that he he doesn't stray as a partner. Um, and that will be the same when a man is performing this violence towards his partners to make sure that she doesn't stray and to control her as an asset uh, to his reproductive success. But if these parents are being violent towards their child. It can be uh, in then in the context of where the violence itself doesn't have a function as much. And this was this is now I'm basing this argument, this, this line of argumentation now is based on uh, uh, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson's uh, idea of that child homicide has no function for the given parent, but not experiencing feelings of love, devotion, patience makes sure that you're not over investing in the child beyond its reproductive value that it has for you. This sounds awful and it's, uh, this sounds horrible that parents should be considering children through a lens of their reproductive value. And if you don't experience a child as having a high enough reproductive value, you will be violent towards it. That sounds awful. That sounds horrible. And I understand people who can react emotional to that and not want to believe this to be true and want a nicer explanation than this. But the challenge then is to ever find a nice explanation to that some parents are violent towards their children or that a man or a woman is violent towards their partner. You will never have a nice one. But you have to have an explanation that will make sense with regards to would evolution make this sort of product? Would evolution make this sort of product? Would evolution make the product of a human species where at times we don't feel the love towards the children that is socially ex expected. We don't feel the patience. We don't want to invest in this child. We Instead, we're feeling this child as a burden, as a problem. Um, and the, the horrible truth of it is that yes, evolution would create such a human species. It takes so much parental investment, not just from the the mother and the father, but from the whole social network, the whole, it takes a village. It does take a village to raise a child. So you have to have resourceful parents with a resourceful network. You need all of these things. So when I'm sitting here saying that parents are viewing their children through the lens of reproductive value, and if, if that is lacking, uh, or if their ability to invest in the child is lacking, then violence can occur. That's the function, not necessarily to be violent, but to have psychological mechanisms that mean that you're not over investing in a child without the prospect of this being successful, successful with regards to your own reproductive success. And it also sounds horrible that a man should be controlling a woman's uh, you know, controlling a woman like she should be some kind of vessel for his reproductive success. But there are no other explanations that is nicer. What you have to evaluate these explanations of and, and the function, what's the function? Um, it has to be a function that is probable with regards to what we know about how evolution selects for and against traits. So, that's Margot and Wilson saying that it isn't the violence doesn't have a function. The function is on a psychological level where parents aren't feeling the love and the patience and the commitment to the well-being of this child. And as a byproduct, you're getting this violence. But then you have other evolutionary psychologists like uh, Joshua Dunkley and David Buss who say that um, child homicide 
uh, and all homicides, but child homicide, for instance, absolutely has the function of th there are psychological mechanisms that make you kill the child, not just not just subject the child to a longer period of neglect and abuse because you're not feeling as a byproduct of not feeling the love, uh, but that it is actually functional to kill a child so that you're not extending the period of investing in the child that won't be, uh, um, that, that regardless will be futile with regards to your uh, reproductive success. Again, I completely understand that people can have an emotional response to this, cognitively just shut off and like, that cannot be the function of violence. But you're gonna still be at a loss to find an explanation of the function of violence, which isn't, which isn't really dark and gloomy. Um, but what you have to evaluate it on if uh, that you're going to like buy this explanation of the function of violence, the function of homicide, is whether or not does it match well with what we know about evolutionary selection forces. And evolutionary selection forces have nothing to do with moral, they have nothing to do with uh, the current situation of parents and couples today. Um, it is a, it, it, we have an evolutionary past that was uh, very unforgiving. It was unforgiving if you weren't investing enough in your child, but it was also unforgiving if you were investing too much in the wrong child under the wrong circumstances. Yes, yeah. also because I imagine that in certain situations, contexts where you don't have enough resources to contribute to the upbringing of uh, several different children. I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, I know this is very controversial to say, but it, it's rational to choose one child in, in which you will invest your resources, right? Yeah, and um, I, I kind of have issues with the word rational um, because um, People, people's perception of the word rational is that it's without feelings, but even the most rational decisions has feelings, like protecting your group against a different group. You can say that is rational, but boy, it elicits a lot of strong feelings. Um, so what the, the term that evolutionary psychologists use within this field is that the violence and the homicides will follow what we call an adaptive mm -hmm. logic. An adaptive logic. So it uh, it follows an adaptive logic that if there are two children in the household, that uh, parents will be more likely to invest, all else being equal with regards to health, etc. Uh, you're more likely to invest uh, in the older child than the younger child. That makes evolutionary sense. That makes adaptive logic. And when evolutionary uh, psychologists test this empirically in data sets of child homicide, you do see it's the youngest child. Youngest child is at greater risk. In my doctoral work, in my PhD work on child homicide and uh, family homicide, um, a hypothesis, an evolutionary psychological informed hypothesis I tested empirically was that those those child homicides, those familicides that were perpetrated in association with perpetrator psychopathology, uh, that being defined as uh, psychosis or suicidal ideation, that they will not follow this adaptive logic. And that is what I found. Mm. Um, now, most of the child homicides, most familicides in Norway today are perpetrated by uh, in, in, in association with the perpetrator's psychosis or uh, suicidal ideation. Uh, and they don't follow adaptive logic. So if you want to test, there's anyone out there with other data sets who want to test the whole adaptive logic hypothesis, you're going to have to make sure that you are disaggregating your child mm -hmm. homicides based on perpetrator psychopathology. Because those without, those are the ones that Duntley, Bus, the Shacklefords, uh, Wilson and Daly, and, and me are arguing those without perpetrator psychopathology, those will follow this strict, harsh, cold, um, adaptive logic. 
but then the altruistic ones, the ones done in, in psychosis and suicidal ideation, where the parent is thinking that this is the best parental act they can do, they can perform, they are contradicting. So then older children get killed, multiple children get killed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about data sets because last time, I, if I remember correctly, at a certain point we talked about li, uh, cross uh, country limitations when it comes to uh, how people in different countries collect criminal data and how they code it and why sometimes it's hard for us to really know what's the correct data because they code it in different ways and etc. Sure. Uh, yeah. But uh, I want to ask you another question now. When it comes to more, let's say, traditional societies like hunter-gatherers, horticulturalists, and even archaeological data that we might have on violence, um, to what extent do we know uh, if these hypotheses are are correct i mean comparing to that kind of data because it is i know that particularly when it comes to archaeological data sometimes it's very limited i'm not sure if you agree or not well there is this uh, um soundbite criticism against uh, evolutionary perspectives on on anything really and that is that we don't know anything about our evolutionary past. This is not true. We know a lot. We know, for instance, that there were two sexes and only one could be pregnant and only one could breastfeed. We, we know things like that, for instance. We know that our children needed uh, in, uh, high investment over several years because we, we know that childhood was a thing uh, uh, teenagers was a thing back then. We know a lot about our physiology uh, and from our way of life. We know a lot from hunter-gatherer societies, like you say, but you also can know a lot about our way of life from fossils uh, and those records. For instance, we know that those skeletons that we are finding that have been harmed through severe violence uh, having skulls crushed in from behind or uh, having um, uh, broken bones or other injuries associated with violent behavior. We know that it was, again, that it was mostly young men being victimized of this. We also know that from also from uh, records that young men were, were uh, they appear to have died in tribal war at a great extent. We know a lot of these things. Uh, and when it comes to our way of life, um, from hunter-gatherer societies, well, what in the book, which is, like I said last time, um, it's more or less my Bible, but the book Homicide by Daly and Wilson, published in 1988, uh, when they are exploring theoretically and empirically uh, child homicide, because in this book they go through different categories of homicide and showing how in a comprehensive manner, in a comprehensive manner, uh, you know, being able to explain and predict a range of aspects in several different homicide categories. The work was pioneering and no one no one has been able to do the same with a different theoretical approach to this day, having such a comprehensive approach to the phenomenon uh, homicide uh, through the use of this one core hypothesis, it will occur in the context of reproductive conflict. Um, well, when they are exploring child homicide, they have two chapters. They have one going through ethnographic records, you know, the hunter-gatherer societies, before they move into more modern day societies like uh, 19th century uh, England and the whole process of getting an infanticide act, etc. And then modern day, well, when they published the book, it was modern day, you know, um, numbers from the 70s and 80s was modern day back then <laughs> when they published that book. Today, one could say, well, that's a traditional uh, prehistoric society in Chicago in the 80s. Um, okay. But in their chapter on ethnographic uh, records from hunter-gatherer societies, they go through their uh, hypothesis on the predictions 
that they could derive from that hypothesis of reproductive conflict and and they get confirmed all their predictions that also in hunter-gatherer societies having a stepfather that was a very Having a stepfather was a risk to children also in hunter-gatherer societies. Um, being a young mother with no resources, both you know your personal resources, but also having a network that's, that's there for you and helping you, that put a child at risk. Um, being the youngest of two siblings put the child at risk. They, they go through all of this uh, data and, uh, and test their hypothesis, test their predictions, and, and it is confirmed. Um, so there's a, there's a long history, and again, the next chapter they go through, again, yeah, England in the 19th century, you know, when you had the industrialization and young women and young men moving into the big cities, and the thing is with young women, they can, they can both have consensual sex and non-consensual rape, and they get pregnant, and what you then do when you are this young woman with you know, you're lacking your personal resources. You don't have this social network. And the thing is that these these women then of the 19th century England were placed in in this hunter gatherer situation where you can't invest in your child. And what do you then do? And the infanticide act was uh, was was partly argued forwards and. Th- through a lot of activism uh, and and also just a, a sympathetic understanding of that, what is a young woman to do without any resources, without a network, and finds herself pregnant. And so the Infanticide Act uh, was a special law that looked particularly at young women uh, killing their infants because of their situation. And so it was explicitly listed that they should be uh, punished less severely than other homicide offenders, um, and in all, several other countries uh, followed this uh, English example, this British example, even in Norway. And uh, when they they did a review of uh, review of and edited uh, quite a few laws in Norway just a handful of years ago. Uh, um, and then they removed this infanticide act that we had in Norway because we barely have this type of homicide anymore because instead of um, instead of um, this village that should help you, um, you now have the government, you have the state that can help these young women. Right. Uh, well, you know, I mentioned that and sort of confronted you with that because uh, I mean of course it's probably not the same data we're talking about but for example uh, Robert Sapolsky in his book Behave at a certain point uh, questions the archaeological data on war deaths uh, and there are anthropologists out there like Brian Ferguson and Douglas Fry who do the same and uh, I mean I was just wondering if uh, that would also apply to some extent to data on filicide, for example, or intimate partner violence. Well, we don't have fossil records of those two categories. Uh, that's, mm-hmm. like I said, that's where you've got the hunter-gatherer data. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but yeah, you can say that the the world is divided in two. And that's those who believe that is in that, that there is documentation of uh, the extent of and the gender bias, sex bias in 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 physical violence, such as tribal uh, warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, those who believe that you can trust that fossil records, they don't just rely their argument on fossil records. They also rely on hunter-gatherer societies and their way of living and, and their tribal warfare. But not only that, they also rely on um, cross, um, sorry, cross-species uh, comparative data, uh, such as that you have warfare among chimpanzees. Mm. You have uh, male chimps who will group together and control their borders, and if they find um, a sole male skirting their borders, they will 
uh, go to a physical attack, which is uh, more grotesque than I'm going to uh, go into detail on here. Um, so you also have the cross species. I have also read um, research articles on um, the way our bodies are built, like for instance, the, the <laughs> non-disputable uh, difference between men and women in uh, body mass, yes, but also our skeletons, upper body strength, etc. The upper body strength of males must have come from somewhere. It's expensive. I think any man out there knows that if, to have a great upper body that doesn't come for free. It's an expensive <laughs> thing to, to produce and make, but you have the genetic ability, some of you, to, to create this incredible upper body and upper body strength, which is much easier to do when you're a young man. Evolution wouldn't have made it like this. Something so expensive, something so potential and potent, if it didn't have a function. But I've also read other articles on, for instance, uh, how our hands are formed. And that our hands are formed in a way that you can actually... Um, that this, apparently, now, this isn't my field, but I've read it, that the way our hands are formed, our fingers are formed, is apparently um, a relic of that, a, a part of our evolutionary history was actually mm -hmm. beating each other with our bare fists. Right. Which came long before um, farming, because there are a lot of authors out there who say that uh, humans became uh, violent and into warfare first upon, uh, first upon farming. Um, that nomads wouldn't be doing warfare and killing each other. But I think uh, it's, it's, it's an extreme argument to say that the psychological mechanisms and everything about our bodies, etc., is that it, that it only occurred like 10,000 years ago because we, we began with the farming 10,000 years ago. Um, I think there's a, too much uh, data out there from a from a variety of scientific fields uh, to ignore. Um, but of course, that the extent of warfare might have intensified upon farming and stable societies. You'll have no argument from me there. Yeah, that might have intensified, absolutely. But I don't think it just came out of thin air 10,000 years ago. There's, there's too much data against it from a, from a range of different scientific fields. Um, and with regards to intimate partner violence and homicide and child homicide, you also have cross-species data there. For instance, chimps are, the males are violent towards females, and in particular the females that they want to copulate with or have copulated with, and um, signs of infidelity are reacted upon with, uh, with severe violence, which in a horrible manner uh, resembles that among us humans. So you don't necessarily need the fossil records for child homicide or intimate partner homicide to recognize that it's, it's all following an adaptive logic, even currently. Currently to the extent of that suicidal and psychotic parents are contradicting this adaptive logic in Norway today. Um, there's an argument in that as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much of that do you think is the result of intrasexual competition? I mean, the way we evolved uh, violent adaptive uh, strategies, let's say. Well, I don't know if you've, uh, I, I don't know if you've read Robert Trivers' seminal work on uh, sexual selection. Yes. Um, it was an elaboration and answering questions that were more skirted by uh, Charles Darwin. Um, and um, Robert Trevor's work has become seminal for a reason in his exploration of how uh, sexual selection uh, is associated with parental investment. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm a firm believer of that parental investment and the, the reproductive conflict being at the at the core. Um, the thing is that I, I did, am I remembering correctly? Did you use the word strategy in your question? Uh, yes. Because here's a very important aspect with the word strategy. Um, in 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 psychology, 
you know, conventional psychology, mainstream psychology, uh, not the Freudian one, but uh, <laughs> <in> psychology. <laughs> uh, uh, the word strategy um, is meant and also gives association with a very uh, conscious approach to the matter at hand. That if you say mm. that it's a reproductive strategy to a regular psychologist, they will think that people are walking around being super duper conscious about, oh, I need to have grandchildren. And so everything I'm doing is to get those grandchildren. But within the field of evolutionary biology and biology, and therefore within the field of evolutionary psychology, we can talk about strategies as the sum of behaviors. Uh, the sum of psychological mechanisms uh, without there necessarily being something conscious there. So a man can meet a woman, fall madly in love with her, and be bothered by the fact that she has children from a previous relationship and not be like that eager to spend time with these children and not really want to invest in them. And when he does spend time with them, he's being very cold and abrupt and dismissive and he might even turn to psychological violence such as name calling and ridiculing and this can escalate into him um, you know not wanting to spend money on food that that child needs and it gets even worse because suddenly he's actually being physically violent towards this child because the child is out of hand and so now things have escalated and as an evolutionary psychologist as a third party i'll watch that and see that as a reproductive strategy that has evolved through sexual selection and i've got the whole of uh, robert trivers article in my head kind of thing but this given given guy I'm describing, he has no strategy here. He's, he, just, he just fell madly in love with this woman and doesn't really like her kids that much. But he's not consciously thinking they are not, you know, they are not my genetic offspring and I want to save my resources for my own genetic offspring and so I have a strategy to so and so. So it's very important when evolutionary biologists or evolutionary psychologists, when we're trying to um, communicate our field to the general public or people from other scientific fields, that we pause and explain how we are using the word strategy versus how they most likely are used to understanding and using that word themselves. So there are strategies here, yes, evolved yeah. strategies, yes, but it, the, the individual isn't like, consciously mapping out, making plans, writing some kind of manifest that they are going to follow uh, as a strategy, you know? So it's, um, it's, it's a long-winded project to, to explain evolutionary perspectives, which I'm sure your viewers are getting an idea from my long-winded answers to your questions. It's like, it's a long walk when I answer questions, but I end up at a point. At, yeah. <laughs> No, no. I mean, come on. Of course, everyone walks around with an Excel sheet, yeah. uh, uh, calculating their fitness. So let's see if I'm going to kill my child or not. If this increases my, <laughs> oh my God. but again, it's like that terrible anecdote I had of lecturing and this criminologist being, oh, so you don't want to like identify these vulnerable children so that you can get rid of them. And I'm like, my God, no. And she's like, oh, because I thought that was your point. I think you should start every lecture with saying that, did that disclaimer. There are a lot of disclaimers for those who use evolutionary perspectives. I was, uh, I was discussing this with a uh, gender researcher uh, a few years back. And she yeah. said that it's so exhausting with these articles in evolutionary psychology. It's so exhausting because you're like, um, you're explaining so much before you get to your point. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. I'm sorry that it's exhausting, but we, we kind of have to, cause we kind of get misunderstood. And despite all our explanations of, um, Robert Trivers, Hamilton, Charles Darwin, 
natural selection is inevitable because you can't escape selection because the human species is not immune to evolutionary processes because the fact that we invest so much in our children is at the core of why we don't always take as good care of them as we should and why we are so horrible towards our partners at times. We have to come with all of these before we then at the end. And so this is how we interpret data so that people don't like lose it and think that, I think that we don't have a theoretical foundation for our hypothesis, that we don't have a foundation for our predictions, and that we don't have a foundation for our interpretations. We do, and yes, it is exhausting, absolutely exhausting. I find it also exhausting that I can't just do an interview and answer questions or hold a lecture or uh, without clarifying, explaining, defining, operationalizer, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Yeah, uh, well, before I ask the, ne the next question, let me just say that we were making fun of Freud, but if there are people out there that I think that strategy in this case means something conscious. Perhaps in this particular case, they should be more Freudian because he <laughs> was a big believer in the unconscious. Yes, and with that regards, we'll give him a smidge in there. <laughs> yeah, but just that, just that. But, but not more, because yeah. he had a, he 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 was dabbling with an evolutionary understanding. It was just that it was um, it wasn't a qualified one. And there have been attempts at, you know, lending an evolutionary thought to things, but um, the, the, the best thing to do is to actually read the work of real evolutionary biologists and read the work of real evolutionary psychologists. Um, the, I mean, I'm giving a, I did this in your last podcast as well, a, a rather dire and dark uh, picture of a, the standing of evolutionary and biological perspectives in Norway today, and I, I mean it, it is dire, it is dark. I just had this experience that I explained this autumn. Um, but the, there are uh, occasions where non-evolutionary psychologists will try to use this field to explain different things. Um, and I will warn against that, that if you, if you haven't, if you haven't qualified yourself within the evolutionary perspectives, you really should be careful with making uh, uh, strong, bold claims uh, in the media, for instance. I mean, just, uh, it was either yesterday or the day before a Norwegian criminologist tweeted to me at Twitter, do not get me started, uh, <laughs> but a Norwegian criminologist tweeted to me, now he has no education within the field of evolutionary biology or evolutionary psychology, and I don't think he has any education within psychology even. But he tweeted to me, you know, telling me about my field, uh, saying that um, you know evolutionary biology, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, from an evolutionary biology perspective, uh, humans uh, have a tendency for racism. And I had to tweet back, what? yes, I'm so, I'm so glad for that facial expression of yours. And I hope most of your viewers made that same facial expression. And if not, I want you to pay attention now. Human nature, evolved human nature has uh, a tendency to make in-out groups. But that is not the same as that we have a tendency for racism. Um, I, is it to be and a nor, nor even necessarily a tendency to just innately categorize people in terms of race? No, right. Yeah. It can be anything. You can take yeah. a group and just say um, blue eyes versus brown. That isn't necessarily racism, right? Um, but you can say people who have uh, names starting with this letter against this or when I when I lecture on social psychology I can say this half of the, the classroom versus this or of the lecture hall that's how easy you can make in out groups but not necessarily on race I mean if you think about it it all started in Africa yeah we were all like brown black yeah something like yeah. that so, and can you yeah. imagine how far into our evolutionary history before we started having populations that were living so isolated that they started uh, producing uh, just on looks 
different traits just on looks. But again, an evolutionary psychologist will say, but you all needed to have a faithful and committed partner. You all yeah. needed to detect who are cheaters and non-cheaters. So, but if you can imagine how far you'd have to travel and then to also create the selection force that you traveled so far and then you met someone who looked differently from you and that's when you started becoming skeptical and aggressive. Uh, sweetheart, even in your tribe you had to decipher, disaggregate between those you could trust and not trust, those you have mate with and not mate with. We, we didn't have time for racism. You wouldn't meet a different population that looked differently from you often enough to have a selection force on creating racism. Uh, and, uh, and, and we have had too many commonalities in navigating and succeeding as humans. Um, so there's no room for uh, you know, race as a social category and not a biological one. But further, humans categorize in out groups but we haven't had an evolutionary history where that in-out group would be based on race. Mm -hmm. So I think Tubi and Cosmites, I believe, have done some work on this, and there are others that have done work on this. But yeah, no, a Norwegian criminologist who, who, who hasn't read evolutionary psychology, and certainly not the work on racism, was telling me on Twitter that he could buy that, but there was something else he couldn't buy that I had said about human nature. Yeah, and, and I mean, as you said, race is just a social category. I mean, it's, very real. it's just an historical accident that uh, we started uh, dividing people in terms of their skin color, mostly in this case. Those societies that were doing that were already dividing people into rather harsh categories, uh, upper class, yeah. middle class, working class and the plebs, the poor, they were already categorizing uh, men and women. I mean, humans do this. And yes, it has now then become also a social category. Uh, eventually, the human species was having contact with people who had been, uh, uh, it, with populations that had been separated for so long that they started having traits that made them capable of surviving and reproducing in their climate. Um, right. So yeah, then, then we started categorizing on that as well. But it's a byproduct, racism is a byproduct of the very human uh, tendency for categorizing on just on absolutely anything and everything. Um, so you can therefore have an in-group that is multicultural. Right. A highly multicultural in-group uh, and their outgroup may be as multicultural. Mm -hmm. So there's something I would really like to ask you, because of course recently, particularly because in the United States, uh, with all of that issue surrounding Roe v. Wade and abortion and all of that, uh, I know there, that there's some literature on this, and since you do work on things like neonaticide, is there any relationship that we know of between legal access to abortion and levels of neonaticide? Yeah, and that conclusion already came back in the 70s. I mean, since the 70s, the field of child homicide research has been very aware of and found repeatedly the pattern of that once birth control, um, because in the same states that are making abortion illegal, they're also moving towards making birth control mm -hmm. uh, uh, also illegal and, and sexual education is also going to be shut down. And, and I think they're also talking about IVF, for example, more recently, I think so. Okay, they, they, prob they, they probably are. <laughs> they probably are. That's my comment on that. They probably are. But we have known since the 70s. And then that was just continuously found 80s, 90s. It's still, it's, it's like basic knowledge among child homicide researchers that if women are, have access, legal, accessible, safe birth control, abortion, you will see a plummet 
in the rates of neonaticide and infanticide. Neonaticide is within the first 24 hours, mm -hmm. uh, infanticide is in the first uh, 12 months. Yes, there is an association. And no one was mentioning this, and I found that really horrific because when um, when Trump became president in the States, people were jumping on the bandwagon of, okay, now we're going to work towards um, making abortion uh, inaccessible, uh, birth control inaccessible, etc. Everyone jumped on the bandwagon. That work started really quickly after he won that election. He was signing papers with groups of men standing behind him. Um, and I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for other child homicide researchers because most of them are American because the States is the country, uh, the country of the westernized countries where you have the highest rates of child homicide, infanticide and neonaticide. Uh, the Nordic countries, we barely have it because of accessible, safe, legal, uh, affordable birth control uh, and abortion, but also other structural things as if if you don't have a partner, if you don't have a village, mm -hmm. you have the government giving you uh, child care, um, a child support, financial child support, etc. Yeah. So we've done everything correct and the States has been doing everything wrong for years and it's getting it's getting worse over there now and I've been waiting for American, you know, uh, based in the States, child homicide researchers who among the list of horrors that women go through if they don't have access to abortion and birth control. No one was mentioning the potential for increased. They're already, they're already remarkable, the rates of infanticide and neonaticide in the States, but that they can, they can actually increase um, with this decision to, to limit women's access to, to birth control and abortion. And no one was doing it. So I, I wrote it in a Norwegian newspaper uh, this summer, I believe, when the Roe versus Wade, I wrote a piece in a Norwegian uh, a newspaper. I've translated it and put it in English on my on my blog uh, um, because it's actually a warning to an international audience more than in, in Norway. You know, we have some voices saying that, yeah, we should also limit women's access to to abortions in Norway. But they're, that's a, it's, they're extremists and um, they're not, they're not going to win. Uh, but they have one in America, they have one in this. And yeah, no, I'm warning against it that uh, you might actually get an increase in the in those states where women uh, don't have access to to abortion now. And their uh, uh, access to birth control is also being limited. And those women who then can't afford to travel across state borders they are then vulnerable to be in this a predicament that I've already mentioned. I mentioned the, the, the young women in the hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, then I also mentioned the young women in London in the 19th century, uh, either working uh, you know, with housekeeping or in kitchens or in, in, in the industry over there. Um, you're putting American women in that same in America today, in 2022, 2023, you're putting in that same predicament of becoming pregnant and birthing children without the ability, without the resources to actually take care of that child. And what these women have uh, have done, they didn't have to, in hunter-gatherer societies, it was a norm that if you got pregnant, but you couldn't take care of your child, um, well, your network of women would know you were pregnant. They'd be with you when you gave birth to your to your infant, and they would support you when you just left your child to die because you couldn't take care of it. And uh, Daly and Wilson in their book describe how these women talk about these experiences with great sorrow, mm -hmm. but also with a pragmatic view of, I couldn't take care of this child. I just, I couldn't. And for the love of the child I already had, I had to do this, unfortunately. But when, when, when you have society saying that women aren't even allowed to become pregnant out of wedlock, uh, whether it's consensual or non-consensual, as it was in London in the 1800s, um, you weren't allowed to have sex out of wedlock. Uh, and I don't, 
think that understanding and grasp of, of rape was somewhat limited. Uh, all the blame was put on the woman alone with a child, and, and, and that's why you had the Infanticide Act. But like I said, a lot of countries, including Norway, the Nordic countries, followed. But you know, there's one country that never followed and made an Infanticide Act. And can you guess what country that was? The United States of America. <laughs> oh my God. And if they are really going to go for this, I know they're working against it. I know they're working hard against it. Uh, the president is working against it. You have judges overruling decisions. Was Georgia the last one where a judge overruled and said, no, you're not going to make this illegal? Um, so, and, and women are out in the streets. Uh, men are out in the streets. More men should join, but some are there. But what are they going to get first? Uh, a legal and, and state, you know, federal, federal law saying women can have an abortion, or are they going to have to resort to an infanticide act in this day and age when other countries are getting rid of their infanticide act because it, it's, a, it's a sleeping act, it's not, you don't have to activate it because women aren't in this position anymore in the Nordic countries, for instance. Like, what are they going to do? Are they going to finally say that abortion is allowed, or are they going to just uh, create an infanticide act, or are they going to do which some uh, some authors, what's her name? Is it Margaret Spinoza? I uh, can't remember her name. But um, writing about how some women, uh, because they don't have this infanticide act, it's very much up to the given court and a given state, how they're going to respond to a woman who has killed her infant or neonate. And some of these women are, just like I said, that if you don't understand that women actually have, you know, innately, they can be violent even towards their own children. If you don't have that understanding, you will you will pathologize them and say there has to be something wrong with the women who are doing it. But also what you can do is what some courtrooms are doing in America, and that is punishing these women more harshly than any other homicide offenders, because there's an idea of that, you know, the maternal nature is deterministic and all women will necessarily just be loving, caring, investing, yada, yada, yada. And so if a woman isn't doing it, we're gonna to have to punish it even harder. So now it's, it's, uh, it's a bleak situation over in the States. Uh, they haven't even been able to keep up with England in the 19th century. Um, it's, it's, it's alarming. And I've, I've really missed hearing from homicide researchers in the States that none of them have said anything about how if we're going to limit people, uh, women's access to abortions, then we are going to see a peak. We're going to see an increase in, in, in this specific category. So eventually I just wrote it in a Norwegian newspaper. I translated it and put it on my blog in English for those who are interested. Um, I, this is very upsetting topics, I am aware, and many people, I'm repeating myself, many people will be even more upset because I have an evolutionary approach to this, but I, I, I will challenge anyone to have a nice, comforting and soothing explanation, a scientific one, for why humans are violent towards each other and even commit homicide. There is, there's not going to be any, there's no comforting explanation, but they can be more or less scientifically valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that in this particular case, when it comes to abortion, evolutionary psychology can also shed some light on where movements against abortion come from. Because I think it was back in the summer that on Twitter, uh, I saw Michael Bank Peterson from Denmark sharing uh, um, a study, I, I, I can't remember exactly if he was an author there or not, but uh, about how um, being against abortion, and it's also interesting that in the States particularly, some of these people are also moving against contraception or access to contraception, yeah. is that it's not really a matter of being pro-life but it's a matter of controlling female uh, sexuality, right? Uh, yeah, because if you're controlling female sexuality, what you're doing is uh, uh, controlling uh, the uh, reproduction. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, 
And that is also, um, but the thing is that um, it's, it's hard to have an evolutionary perspective on why some people want to force women to have these children and we want to force women to have these children, but not in any shape or form help them raise them. Oh yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. So I, I, I absolutely agree on that. Uh, to understand the human tendency to want to control and have an opinion about female reproduction. To want to control, have an opinion about female reproduction. There are going to be evolutionary uh, uh, roots to that uncanny and unhealthy interest. <laughs> um, but it just strikes me that the same people in, in the States, mind you, in the States, mind you, those who want to force women to have these children aren't particularly eager to help them raise them. Uh, right. So... Um, they seem to be a car crash of thoughts and emotions when they call it pro-life. Because they say that life begins at conception, but they don't seem to understand that it continues after birth. <laughs> I mean, George, I Car George Carlin, the comedian, <laughs> had an interesting take on this. He said something like, they're not really pro-life, they are pro fetuses or something like that, because they care about you when you're in the womb, but once you're outside, they don't care at all, you're on your own. They have no concerns with toddlers. And how many, how many newspaper articles have you not read over the years of toddlers in the States shooting themselves or their loved ones with guns? Yeah. Same people are pro-guns. Um, but in Norway, in Norway, those who are working, you know, th those who are using politics as a platform to prevent women from having, you know, free access to abortion. Uh, and when you say free access, you're also talking about legal access, because we know that if you don't have free access to abortion, you're going to be using illegal manners. So, yes, that's why I'm using the phrase free and legal access to abortion. Um, they are claiming to be concerned with um children after they are born as well and they want to help they are they they want like childcare benefits to be increased and they want to help poor families so in norway uh, it's it's more believable it's more believable that they actually are pro life but i don't know i'm i'm very much for pro choice uh yeah. Obviously, and it is an as an evolutionary psychologist that knows that um, that has read the ethnographic records. I have read the tales of these women in hunter gatherer societies that just couldn't couldn't foster that child and what they go through. I have read the research of um, the slums of Brazil in the 1980s, as as late as in the 1980s in the slums of Brazil. Uh, women were neglecting children, knowing that this child was going to die within days if it was neglected. Nevertheless, that was their option to neglect these uh, uh, children because they just they couldn't foster them and they knew it very well. Um, you have research on abortion because people are concerned with uh, how do these women fare after having an abortion? And you have research showing that women are very pragmatic with regards to having abortions. Um, and th these are under the circumstances you have in the Nordic countries where there's not that much stigma attached to it and mm -hmm. you get access to abortion uh, through state-funded healthcare services so that there's there's... There's, there's not the trauma of having activists shouting at you, uh, people throwing pictures at you, shaming, but that 
that it's accepted that some women are in this predicament. And when you then ask these women, how, you know, how do you feel about having had your abortion? They're very pragmatic and say it was it was the best solution. They're not regretting it. It was the best solution. Um, there is Norwegian data showing that uh, women who are um, undertaking education are using abortion as a means of ensuring that they can be good mothers, resourceful mothers. And that's when they have children, when they're done with their education, when it's with a committed partner, um, when they have what they need, when it's to space, space the birthing of the children that they have to make sure that there's enough years that they're not coming to with too high a frequency, the children that they do birth. Women want to be good mothers. Historically, in, in, in westernized societies like the Nordic countries, today we have access to the means of becoming good mothers. And I think we should pay attention to and pay heed to that these Nordic countries uh, have, have historically low rates of violence, physical abuse, neglect and child homicide. If you give women a chance to be good mothers, they will make sure that they are good mothers. So you have to trust women here. They know what they're doing. Oh my, no, but you can talk about a state funded health care, because if you mention that in the United States, they will they would lose. just socialists or communists. <laughs> Well, maybe communists don't kill their children as much, but it, of course it isn't communism. I, it, it's it's an odd thing. It's an odd thing to 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 live in the Nordic countries and hear that we are communists. That's really odd because it it, it most certainly is not. It most certainly is not. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, this really bothers me as well because they even contradict themselves. Because, for example. Uh, they say that women are nurturing and they have sort of maternal instinct, something like that. But at the same time, they also think that if abortion is legal, then it just turns into an epidemic of abortions and women yeah. are aborting all the time, <laughs> everywhere. Just for fun. Uh, but actually, what you've seen also in the Nordic countries is a decrease in abortions uh, yeah. over the past decades. And that is because women are increasingly in a position to uh, plan if, when, with, who, with whom they become pregnant. And also when become pregnant, they have an education and they do have jobs, uh, which means that they can support this child. Um, but, but, uh, no, there's, the States are a far cry from, uh, I mean, I remember in the nineties, I saw, uh, the Oprah Winfrey show where Oprah Winfrey, uh, states boldly that if you're, if you're born as a woman in the States, uh, you've won a lottery. And even back in the nineties, as a child, I knew that that was not true. I knew that the, the, uh, that the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries, Norway, which I was in. Um, no, that is winning the lottery. Uh, but still, even in the Nordic countries, um, women still have their struggles here. But it's nothing like um, the struggles of the uh, women in, in, in the States. Yeah. I mean, uh, is there, just before we finish, is there anything else you would like to say about abortion? I mean, because I don't even know what to say anymore apart from what, what has been mentioned already. So. I'm just really happy to see that there are judges overturning uh, decisions, you know, that, that there is a lot of work um, to ensure women's rights in, even in, in even in the situation that suddenly, well, not suddenly erupted in the States, it's been a long time coming, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, but it's, it's continuously, continuously a, a fight to, 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 to look at their rights. But I don't know if one should only frame it as a female right to abortion because uh, I, I have no idea why there aren't more men voicing their concern 
uh, in that if you are forcing women into parenthood by forcing them to birth uh, unwanted children, you're also forcing men into parenthood as well. So one shouldn't just reduce abortion rights to, a f it is a female health issue, but it's a human rights issue. Uh, it's, uh, women are humans, so that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> but also men are humans and human rights. I mean, uh, if anyone has watched this far into this podcast episode, and if any of them have the will to live and to remember what I mentioned in the beginning about how uh, reproductive violence is a thing, um, forcing someone into parenthood. Well, any state that denies its citizens uh, access to free and legal abortion is denying that access to both men and women. They're denying both men and women the possibility to plan if, when, and with whom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and by the way, since you mentioned the it being an health issue, it's also an health issue in another way that is, if you ban abortion completely, then there are situations like, for example, in the case of ectopic pregnancies, where you're basically condemning women to death. You are. If... And that is, there's no pro-life in that. Nope. Yeah. Well, anyway. On that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I hope. Um, well, uh, where can people find you on the internet? Um, well, I think we're all leaving Twitter now, aren't we? Uh, I don't know how long it will last. No, 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 <laughs> I no, have no. 5,000 followers there, so I don't know. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't... We're just around the corner from leaving Facebook also, aren't we? I mean, I don't know. No. <laughs> I um, don't know what, what is the next <laughs> social media platform we're going to migrate to, but anyway. Let's... The thing is that both of these platforms have been brilliant for science dissemination. It's also been a brilliant platform for dissemination of uh, ra racism, misogyny, hatred, uh, fake news. And even created a terrible president. Um, but so far, I am still on Twitter and I am still on Facebook. And I also have, um, whenever I write things, because uh, I, I write a lot of opinion pieces, I write a lot of um, uh, scientific essays. You know, just I, I don't just do the whole peer-reviewed scientific article thing. Uh, I think the um, the knowledge I have is so important to get out to the general public because researchers we know the general public they don't. Um, so I have this um, scholarly blog um, where I mostly, apart from this uh, text I had on the internet side, I write in Norwegian. Yes, but Google Google translation might be okay. Um, but other, otherwise, I, I probably should get on ResearchGate. That's where I should be. Um, so I'll, I'll have a look uh, uh, at that over the Christmas holiday, I think, and see if I can get on ResearchGate uh, and uh, list my publications there um, so that, uh, you know, my, my, um, my uh, not just like opinion pieces. That's what I mean, like when, you know, uh, scholarly textbooks on and my articles so i should i should probably get on researchgate uh, yes you should researchgate is nice so. yes <laughs> okay so thank you so much again for coming on the show and i really hope to have you on again somewhere in the future so i'd love to come again thank you so much uh, thank you so much for your patience uh, like i said long-winded answers but i get to a point at some point point it might not be the point you were hoping for but there's a point at the end uh, one has to be patient with me but thank you so much i'd love to be back and um it's a pleasure even though we're talking about very dark very controversial uh topics uh, so i i hope we're able to keep it both serious and, and and light for your audience thank you so much for for the attention
Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Riccolani, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Wo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zuc, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Nguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Uni, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Aslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dej Araujo, Romain Roach, Dermitri Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavlos Tazevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, John Linares, Lida Cosmidis, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gage, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackelford, Sunny Smith and John Wisman. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Keaton, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull and Nun Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.